Well, good morning. It's 9 o'clock, so um, I think I'll get started. I'm Sharon Gensler, and I'm here to talk about healthy soil and healthy gardens. I really don't want to stand behind the podium, get your hand out, and come in. Um, so, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, see, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> of my homestead in, in Wendell, Mass, just to entertain you while you listen to the boring details. Um, you know, I've been working with Milford, Mass for many years. I was on the board of directors, and I was the outreach coordinator, and I then um, I retired in 2017 because I just felt like, okay, let some younger folks start getting involved, and uh, then all of a sudden, I was at one of the women's marches in January, and I was like, oh my god, climate deniers. And then it was like, climate was an issue. Well, now climate is a crisis. Um, so I went on the road with my little presentation about how us, as a drop in the bucket, and it's like the rain, one drop at a time in that bucket, are we really doing anything? I say yes, because I'm an optimist, that eventually all of us people doing small things can make a difference. And the thing I love to do most of my life is garden. And so using things in the garden, it can help climate change, help create healthier food, and um, make the world better. It seems really important. Then Julie Ross and our executive director said, well, you can't be out there on the road on yourself. You've got to come back and work for us. So I'm part, part time. And if any of you want to invite me to your community to speak, uh, if you talk to me, you are right, Sharon at nocamass.org, uh, you can get a hold of me, and uh, I'm on the road. So, I live in Wendell on a small homestead with my partner and I, and I grew up on a small farm, family farm in upstate New York, where we used tractors and we used uh, regular conventional, though it was back before there was a whole lot of chemical usage, but still. Um, it was a different way of growing. I went off, became a college administrator, worked for a few years and hated it. And <coughs> even though I couldn't wait to get away from the farm, it was like, i got to get back to the soil. So I uh, obtained this land in 1980. And um, fortuitously, in 1980, I was also working at the New England Small Farm Institute in Belchertown. And we invited a man called named Bill Mollison. Hey. He's one of the co-founders of Permaculture. And for a week, he walked around with us, staff, and blew my mind. He, he just would look at something that the rest of us thought was a problem, and he would make it be an opportunity. For instance, a huge rock, instead of trying to move it, you know, break your back or get a bulldozer, he says, okay, that rock is collecting heat all day. Plant your heat-loving things near it. And when, uh, at night, it'll keep them warmer. Birds will come and sit on it, my baby brother. And as they sit, sit there, they might poop. And then when it rains, you get fertilizer. And, uh, you know, so that rock is a win-win. My, my uh, garden is full of rocks. Because I've just gotten the land. And it was totally wooded, a complete forest, 100-year-old trees. So we cut it, everything at soil level and built up <coughs> permaculture techniques which are now called lasagna gardening of wood chips and manure. So <coughs> lo and behold, that was in 1980 that I started. So it's been a couple of years. <laughs> but the soil now is so deep and rich and productive. Uh, and, the, and the part that's really excellent from my point of view is that I couldn't use any rototillers. I tried, one, I tried the, one of the first seeds and then it took all my fillings on my teeth just about because of the rocks and the stumps and everything. And it just didn't feel right. And so everything has been by hand. I use a French intensive permanent bed system where I never, okay, rarely ever put a foot in the bed. So it, it's, these beds have been uh, designated and then paths designated. So, um, anybody know 
what that is for me. That's a pawpaw flower. Isn't that good? Oh, you know, we could, these would all look so much better without so much light. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. Did someone throw that switch? Have you gotten through that with pawpaws this week? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, they've been very, we only have three trees and they've been very productive, but have you ever heard that song about the pawpaw patch? They sprout up and uh, they're everywhere, uh, so be careful of that if you do it. Um, moving right along here, let's see. I wanted to show you a picture out my, my wind, kitchen window of the main vegetable garden. and. Um, this is in August a few years ago, but everything, uh, I, my previous partner in the long ago wanted to have straight rows, everything totally clear and perfect uh, in the old traditional sense. And this just would drive her and then be crazy because it's just somewhat wild. Though everything, pretty much everything in there is productive uh, as food for me and household. So th this is just another picture to show um, the permanent beds that don't get walked on, small paths between, large uh, paths for the carts and wheelbarrows. And I use a lot of uh, mulch, and we're going to talk about mulch and cover cropping and things as we go along. But uh, the only time you see bare soil is when I'm getting ready to plant, uh, because that's really an important element of healthy soil. So that gives you a sense of what it looks like when, when I'm talking about things. <laughs> so today what I want to do is briefly talk a little bit about the carbon sequestration because that's what got me motivated here to come out and talk to people. Uh, and I spend most of our time about, about soil itself and the, uh, what creates healthy soil. And I'm a this rabid no-till cover cropper. And so I'll spend most of the time on those two things. And what I'm asking is that you hold your questions until the end because I think I'll cover many, many things. I know I will. Uh, and I want to have everybody go away with no, getting something out of it. And then the questions will specific to yours or whatever we can do uh, at the end. I'll leave plenty of time. So, um, when I first moved to the valley, I rented two acres in, in Hadley, the seventh most fertile valley in the world. Uh, this isn't a picture of that spot, but it was like that after a rain, because that soil has been killed over um, a couple of, you know, centuries of bad practices. And this is the soil that came from the forest and building up in my place. So we want to go from this to this, and how do we do that? <clears throat> so in general, we want soil biology. We want to mimic nature uh, as much as possible, because nature's been here for eons and has really done a great job of, of populating the earth with plants and animals and all. So the more we do that by, by uh, helping <coughs> The, the right conditions for both microbial life in the soil, um, then the, the better our soil will be. So, and, and this produces healthier plants. And the healthier your plant is, the more nutrient value it has when you eat it. And it's amazing the flavor difference and also the color differences and the shelf life of plants that are grown on really microbial healthy soil. And let me just cut back to one thing. Those handouts have almost all of the verbiage so that you don't have to <coughs> worry about missing my <laughs> every word. Um, Where is that? Yeah. At, at the back corner of the room. So if anybody hasn't gotten a handout, they're in the back corner of the room. Uh, it also it decreases pest and disease pressure, and all the while it's doing that whole business I'm talking about, about carbon. So moving right along quickly, <clears throat> this is the carbon cycle we learned somewhere along grade school or high school. Uh, to keep the, keep the green things go, growing as best as possible. Um, they're breathing out 
oxygen. We're breathing, all us mammals are breathing in oxygen. We're breathing out carbon dioxide, so we've got this great cycle. We've got these, these emissions and everything over here that we do really need to cut back on and try to, try to limit in our culture. But agriculture is the second most, uh, is one of the major culprits in carbon in the atmosphere. So, you know, like I said, we're little drops, but we can make a difference. We can also talk to legislators, talk to you know, our community farm, talk to somebody who's a bigger grower than we are, and try to get them to start investigating and maybe change some of their practices. Um, so, I, how many of you, obviously, you're all growers of some nature, right? So you know most of this stuff, but I put it here because sometimes I go to totally uninformed um, communities talking about carbon in the soil. But that soil organic carbon is really essential to healthy plants. And um, it's 58% of the total organic mass is found in the soil, and it's the largest pool of terrestrial carbon. So if you think about that, the more, and we'll talk about it later, the more tilling that happens and the more exposure of soil to the atmosphere, the more carbon dioxide is released. And since the Industrial Revolution, in the beginning of the combustion engine, engine where uh, tractors you know, went full tilt, breaking up of the Great Plains and everything, we have emitted 790 billion tons up to 1999. Well, We've got to be way over that by now. Uh, so we want to try to decrease that as much as we can. And putting that carbon into the soil, one of the biggest ways to do that with these healthy plants and is through photosynthesis and having our plant roots go as deep as possible so that the soil is, uh, so the carbon is taken down into deeper layers where, it, where it's less likely to be exposed to air. And there's a lot, a lot of information out, out in the world. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this. Soil carbon restoration, can biology do the job? Jack Kittredge, who was our policy coordinator uh, at the time, wrote this. It is just full. It's not outdated. There's a lot of things that could be added to it. But it's for sale down in the lobby, or you can go get it free online. And it's, it's basically in all the research that up to that time a few years ago about soil carbon. And it was so well done, it went to the Paris Peace Accord uh, and has spread around the world. I can't remember how many languages it's been reprinted into. So our old Dario Nofa did that from S. So again, this is on the sheet, but the benefits besides putting carbon into the soil, we get that better food and uh, healthier food, so all of us are healthier. And when people go, oh, organic costs so much, they're not considering what, it's, what not organic is doing to the planet by the use of chemicals and the cost of them and our medical uh, expenses because all of us aren't as well as we could be because we're not uh, necessarily eating healthy food. And personally, I think the obesity is part of this, of our culture, because what this is a USDA study that 50 years ago, an apple or any pretty much anything you ate compared to something you eat now that's not uh, organic or biologically grown, is 30 has contains 30 to 50 percent less nutrients than it did 30 to 50 years ago. Well, think about that. You have to eat way more to have your body receive the nutrients that it needs. So it has to affect us. And we could be growing healthy food that has our nutrients for our family, uh, ourselves. Um, just a, a really simple thing off the internet, mostly covered with green. This is the layer where uh, organic matter that's dead and dying is decomposing by, by soil microbes and turning into that, that layer of soil that we really need for uh, healthy plants. Uh, very deep roots going, sorry, very deep roots going down into this, these different layers of soil and uh, 
Uh, this is showing soil aggregate, which is that uh, the clumps of soil, so it's not packed clay or just sand. You have that really nice top of cake crumb. Uh, and this soil is just full of uh, living things you can see. In this thing, it's the worms, but there's a lot of microbes, I'm sure, in that soil. The thing is, as this decomposes and or bare soil, carbon is real, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, but by having the plants right there covering your soil, they are taking it in as a nutrient, and it's not getting up to the atmosphere. So it's just these little things to think about. Um, never crossed my mind. So maybe it was sixth grade in New York State where I was, somewhere back there we learned about photosynthesis. Yes, the sun and water and uh, carbon dioxide, a green plant takes that and turns it into simple sugars. So that's a very simple explanation. And much research is being done um, presently about the more detailed how that really works. And not only simple sugars, but there's all kinds of amino acids and chemicals and uh, terpenes and things that, cause, that are the flavor of the plant or that are created. So the healthier conditions we give a plant, the more, the higher the rate of photosynthesis. And that higher rate of photosynthesis, um, the plant then uses uh, some of that for its own growth, but then it goes ahead and expels that into the soil through through its roots. It, some people say 20 to 60 percent, I heard even higher percentage, of that nutrient that the plant is creating is put back into the soil. Wow. So I like to tithe. I couldn't live. I mean, it's hard for me to even give 10 percent to worthy causes, but think about 60% of what you what you create or, or make, giving that away. So nature, everything is connected. And why is that happening? It's because they receive something in return. It's that all that, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So what what's going on and what who gets what and what what's what's the return? Again, just another internet photo to show the green and this really thick root mass here, and the darker colored soil, which is, is where we have a really healthy soil, and how deep, how deep these roots go. Um, that's really what we want in our gardens as much as possible. Uh, just another uh, schematic of that, th this area, very little green, and very few roots all the way over here. We've got a lot of green above uh, doing photosynthesis, and look at that root mass. You know, deeper, uh, the, the whole mass of it is, is much more intense, and it's giving off more of those treats to the soil microorganisms. There are handouts on the chair as you come in. Um, so, being good gardeners, we all know that every teaspoon of soil is just full of a billion or billions of creatures. And that's the creatures that we really want to encourage and help do, uh, do their thing. So there's also, I don't know, in the last five, ten years or more, a whole lot on the bio, uh, our own intestinal bio uh, biology and uh, the microbes that we have. And so if you look at, as an, as an individual creature, we all have this amazing complex biology going on within our own bodies. And then that is, that's what is happening on a different scale in the soil. And to try to keep in mind that we're not different, but we are part of this whole thing that's going on in the world. Um, so the key role of these microorganisms, from, from our perspective, the key role, is taking uh, nutrients, taking chemicals, uh, minerals, and turning them into be something that's bioavailable to the plant. There's a lot of minerals and things in the soil that are just locked up and dead to, not, not dead, but not able to be utilized by the green plant. So these microbes help that to happen so that the plant can take them up and, oops, 
here we are in bacteria already. So they're huge numbers. And when you think of bacteria, it's like, oh my god, they're terrible. Let's have to take antibiotics. But yes, there are some bacteria that aren't so happy and healthy for us and for plants. But there are also a huge number of bacteria that are beneficial. And just for one, think of how many of you use that, that black powder when you put it on your legume when you go to plant your beans or your peas. That's a bacteria. It's a rhizome or something or other. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a bacteria that coats your seed and when you plant it and it's part of it becomes part of the soil, it pulls nitrogen from the atmosphere and makes it available to the plant, the plant roots. So there are bacteria that we really, really need, and they're just beginning to scrape the surface of how many and what they are. Um, <coughs> in our region, uh, we're predominantly a fungal soil, and that is a really good thing because fungi are really um, have such an amazing symbiotic relationship with uh, our green plants. This is, a, I believe, a pine seedling. It's just one little seedling. When I looked at it, I thought, oh my god, look at that. Those roots and those root hairs. <laughs> the roots are just this, these darker, kind of orangey things. The rest of this is all fungal uh, mycelia, which uh, to me looks like a brain, or what I imagine maybe an internet would look like schematically. So there's this one plant, but there's never just one plant unless you're just really tidy in your garden. There's always other plants around. And these, so it's not just this one root mass of mycelium, and not root mass, but mycelium mass connected to the roots, uh, interfacing with the roots. It's, there are a lot of them. Uh, and then they all interface together. So these mycelium are a transportation network, and they're also a communication network between in amongst themselves, with the plant that they're associated with directly, and also with neighboring plants. <coughs> and there's all kinds of studies, and way back in the <coughs> excuse me, in the 70s, uh, that secret life of plants. That's all part of this. That plants do communicate between themselves, and um, if there's a disease in one plant, it'll send that message through its roots, the mycelium pick it up, spread it to other plants, and then they miraculously, the mycelium helps the plant release within the plant structure um, chemicals and things that exudates that will help deter that disease from um, affecting the plant. The same with insects. I want to go back to this a second because it's just a symbiotic relationship. The bacteria have it too. The bacteria and the fungi have symbiosis together and all of these creatures. So it's not just one and one. It's multiplied. Um, and I'll just hold that picture in your mind a few minutes and we'll <coughs> uh, come back to talking about it. So this is a root tip. And all these guys are the mycelium again. And they don't just surround it. They're passing through the roots. So that's how, I have no idea uh, what science is working on, all the ways that that's important. Another major uh, breakthrough is finding this, uh, discovering this thing called glomalin, which is, the, if you've ever pulled up a plant uh, and it's like black soil clinging to your roots, your root mass, it's really good soil. That's, that is, this glomalin is a a glycoprotein that's a glue, and it helps build soil aggregates, which are really important uh, harboring place and, uh, for microorganisms, but also help give to your soil your texture and your tilt so that water and air can pass through it. Um, it's also a huge factor in storing soil carbon for the longer terms, 40 to 100 years, depending on the depth of the uh, um, so we want to we want to manage our photosynthesis by managing our microbes, and it's just a circular thing. You know, which do you do first, the chicken or egg? Or, you know, you want to have this all this whole thing working. So it's building soil from the top down, 
keeping your soil covered at all times, making sure you have soil balance by using uh, a intuition or looking at your plants or doing a soil test, uh, regularly adding nutrients if you need them through sprays or drenches. And uh, so I'm not sure I would ever eat one like this, <laughs> being who I am, but this is my diversity take. Uh, I always think of soil as having these layers, and everybody lives in their own layer that's so happy for them, it makes them you know, be able to function at their optimum. So um, what happens when a two-year-old comes and instead of waiting for her slice, just smashes into it? You know, it's really dis <coughs> disrupted. And then we go back to this, and you think, of what happens when a rototiller goes through that? When you take your fork and you turn it over, or you plow it. That's a little bit of a major disruption. I like to compare it to a tornado coming through our communities. We may have our house uh, damaged or destroyed. We may be injured or killed. For sure, the communication network, transportation network, water, sewage, all those things are affected by that whirlwind coming through. So if you whirlwind this transportation and communication network, you're ending up um, doing something that isn't as beneficial for your for your soil as it could be, so it's not optimizing it. That's not to say that if there's some time you really need to till you know, once a season or something that, that I'm going to outlaw it with, as a squad, the soil squad. But, um, like I said, 1980 I started. Uh, I tried to till one small section once, and since then uh, it's never been tilled, and I have this fantastic soil. So, uh, it can be done. And again, if you till that, you're, you're messing up your whole <coughs> structure. So these are the benefits of no-till. Um, um, and we've talked about a lot of them, but some, some different ones are also <coughs> that the more the more you have that crumb and that deep uh, connection within the soil, you help with erosion control, uh, air and moisture can penetrate deeply. Um, I started out it was forest. I didn't have many weeds the first couple of years. And then they came. They just came. And there was weeds, gallant so and this and this and this. It was like a constant hassle for a while until I got my balance up. And then, or like rarely do I have a weed uh, that I'm really concerned about. <coughs> because weed seeds are in the soil and they're dormant. And if you're not pulling them up where they have uh, sun and water and everything optimally to, to germinate and grow, they're just down there and they're not doing any harm. So that's a big advantage that um, after a couple of years, you'll, I hope you'll notice. So how do you do this? Oh my God, I've told all my life, what do I do? Here's a bed that's just covered with baby, tiny little green things uh, that we call weeds. And so I've only used this once for this slideshow. Uh, and this is called solarization, and you put a sheet of clear plastic on very young, tender greens. The first, um, for 24 hours, maybe 48 max, because the heat generated will kill the plants, but it'll also kill your microbes, and we don't want to do that. Um, but often, often we have those um, weeds that get beyond the little baby, or the perennial weeds, and they're really harder to get rid of. So you can do occultation, which is putting something dark. Uh, this is a picture off the internet, but it's black plastic. I usually use um, cardboard because cardboard decomposes uh, and is a worm factory. So <coughs> it blocks the sun. It blocks. It creates moisture under there, and anything that's larger usually rots and becomes the worms love it because it's it's moist and there's food. In it. So those are the two things. So I must say, it's really hard to get rid of dock or dandelion. Things like that have been around for a, for a long time and uh, have really deep roots. And um, I eat them. And I cut them back and I eat them and I eat them back. So that's what I do with them, those kinds. So another big no 
no-till method is mulch, uh, mulch, mulch, mulch. And before I started doing cover crops, that's all I did was mulch. It creates fantastic soil over time and is a, a feed for your, feeds the microbes, moderates your soil temperature. temperature. So what kind of tools do we use for this? Um, 1979, even before I was on my land, I bought this. It was then called a double digger. They're now broad forks. They're massive out there. They're, they're pricey, but they really do if you have a compact soil and you need to break it up a little. But it's still, it's not turning it. It's just sticking it in there, rocking it, and fluffing it to aerate and to help. Um, I often use it um, when I before I plant a root crop just to make sure it's light enough for them to enjoy. Uh, if you don't have that, just your regular garden fork without tipping, flipping. So now this, this is the, uh, I thought the room would have a clock to keep me on track. It doesn't. So uh, this is the bulk of my thing it is, I hope, is cover crops because I always thought, oh, cover crops. That's for the big farms, us little kids, you know. And then one day I thought, well, why not? So I started experimenting here and there with just small, small little bit. And the benefits I started receiving in those small areas was so amazing that I have converted to uh, as much cover crop as I can manage to put in my garden I use. So there's a difference between cover crop and green manure. Uh, your green manure is it's basically the same whatever seeds you're planting, uh, usually a grass and a legume like oats and peas uh, or whatever. You let them get up a couple of inches tall and then you, if you're a regular person, you might till them under, but we don't do that. So we're going to cut them at soil line or just below soil line and um, leave the residue on top of the soil. And at that point you can also throw a piece of plastic clear plastic to, to do that solarization to, if you want to really pull it off to make sure it's dead. And then that's going to give you a boost of fertilizer, especially nitrogen. So you might want that occasionally, but you don't want to then a plant right into it. It'd be the same as, as planting into, you know, nitrogen you sprinkle on the soil. Give it a couple of weeks before you plant. This is really good for that short-term burst. But for the long-term, we really want cover crop because they are doing the, the longer improvement, not, not just that burst of a hit of energy that you get from a sugar hit. You know, this is going to give you that slow release over time, over the season, and over the years. So fungus that we talked about, uh, they prefer eating uh, wood chippy kind of things, the straw, uh, lignin. The, the part of lignin is what gives the structure of, of straw or hay or, or the, the bowl of a, a tree. And so if you're cutting that green manure really young, there's no lignin there yet. So the bacteria are really happy with that. But your, your fungus doesn't want that. So um, you try to let this grow longer until it's more mature where it has a, a bigger stock. The roots are also going deep. All this time is photosynthesizing, so it's doing all those things we talked about already. And by having your roots go deeper, you're improving your soil texture and you're feeding microbes at deep, deeper and deeper levels and putting the carbon in deeper and deeper. So I have to, this slide will come up a couple of times, but I just have to point out, look at that crumb. It was a chocolate cake, I do one happy girl. Mm -hmm. so, um, Benefits of the cover crop are almost identical to that of the no-till. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over it, but uh, building that soil aggregate is just amazing. Um, you can use a cover crop as a living mulch uh, as long as you keep cutting it short so it's not competing with your, your vegetable plant. So this, this slide uh, I love just because it has a really amazing root mass on this one compared to the top, uh, where it's, you know, it always said so as above, so below. But this, some of you know, some of this is, if we do our job really well, we're making uh, a 
as above, no, uh, uh, way more below than as above. Um, anyway, this one, this plant is either died back or was cut back, and I'm, I'm a cut backer all the way along these days. Instead of pulling, I rarely, rarely, rarely pull a plant out of the garden, whether it's a weed or a vegetable. And about, I don't know, 25 years ago, I'm sorry, this process, it goes by itself. Um, I pulled up. I have to admit, I didn't get my garden put to bed in the fall fully. So come spring, I'm out there and I'm seeing all these well, big stumpy brassica things. <laughs> so, um, you know, pull up, pull up, and about the third one, I'm going, what am I doing? It's just the worms were just falling off of it. And so think about what, what are the, why are the worms there? Because it's food for them, it, you know. So. I stopped doing that and then started cutting them off, putting the tops in the compost, <coughs> leaving the roots in the soil. So they make air and uh, water pathways down deeper to aerate our soil. Uh, here, this one is making a channel for these other roots, easier to get deeper. And uh, it, it, it also helps if you have compacted soil to keep your roots in. And also by pulling your root, you're doing the same thing, not quite as bad as tilling, but you are disrupting your soil profile. You're disrupting that cake. So where are these cover crops useful? Uh, here's what I'm going to talk about. In, I'm going to talk about where they're useful, and then seeding techniques, and the types I use, and a cocktail, and the management, and then an example. So um, it's kind of hard to figure out how to get everything right at the time. You might not have that question, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll have those questions. Sorry. So where I use them, pretty much in the garden, anywhere I can. I use them wherever there's bare soil, before or after planting or under under uh, crops. I all since I've started doing this, I get more I get more food per uh, garden plot than I than I can use. So I every year I've taken out more and more. I've had probably. For a third of the garden no longer in vegetable production at all, any one time. It's in cover crop. So I'm using that as a rotation and as soil building. Well, I'm still getting the same amount of food I need out of a smaller amount. Um, so we'll go through all of these. We also use them in the orchard and pasture. Uh, I don't have a lawn, but if I did, they say you can use cover crops in your lawn. So this was a probably a 14-inch section end of a bed that I didn't get, I didn't have enough uh, onion seedlings to put in. So this is beginning of August, August 1st. These have germinated, and they probably went in less than you know four or five days because in August seeds germinate really quickly. So uh, they're up. Here's two weeks later. They're a good eight inches tall. Notice how they're covering the soil. They're photosynthesizing, keeping the moisture in, they're keeping the weeds out, and they're passing nutrients on to those onions. I could have just left it bare, or if I didn't have a cover crop seed, some mulch would, would work. But So then, like I said, I take some of the beds out for the full year, and then use them in various different ways to rotate uh, or what, what, for whatever my need is. So if I, if I, we're going to get to this in a minute with seeds, but some seeds, as with all with your vegetables, are more cold hardy than others. Oats and peas and then radish are much more cold hardy than buckwheat and sorghum and things. So in early spring, I'll be planting oats and peas, but then I'll let them grow. Sometimes the whole, until they're fully mature, they'll drop their seeds. They'll fall over. The lignin will be there for the microbes to digest. Don't turn it in. I just leave it there. Then I might throw another whole oats and seeds that seeded themselves. They'll germinate and come up again. I'll put some buckwheat in with it and some of these other things that are more sensitive. Uh, but keeping that out of vegetables. Or I could cut it um, at any time, more than once even during the year, and use that biomass in my compost or use that biomass to create a mulch. I don't have enough mulch. 
Okay, I should go back here. So this this is uh, just to show you a sequence. A garlic bed. The garlic we pulled in um, late July. This is late August, so that's probably 10 or 12 inches tall or more. Here it is a month later. Uh, it's over three feet tall. Here it is uh, October 11th, and it's over the top of my head and most of it over the top of my arms. And then we start getting cold weather, and it starts dying back. Uh, December, the beginning of December, everything's dead except these green things, which are radishes, and they'll die shortly, but they're not dead yet. Uh, there's probably 12 inches there of uh, cover crop mulch, and the leaves have blown in because I live in the woods. So the stubble from the, from the cover crop has caught the leaves. So there's at least 12 inches thick mulch. I didn't have to go out and haul it in. I didn't have to put it on the garden. I didn't have to do any labor except sow those seeds after I pulled my garlic. Sometimes... Well, lately with the spring has been, you know, cold, hot, rain. It's so, I don't try to get my tomatoes and peppers and, and sensitive vegetables in now to get that first tomato. I wait until the first or even sometimes second week of June to start planting those things. But I don't want that bed to sit idle that whole time. So I'll put an early crop of usually the oats and peas and radish in in April. It has grown, and by the time June comes along, that bed has been photosynthesizing for quite a while. I cut it back um, and just leave it on top as a um, as a mulch. And right around the basin where I'm planting, I've, I've uh, cut the roots so that they're not going to come back and plant my transplant in there. So free mulch, that'll come back up unless I cut it below the soil line, then that will kill it. But I, I, will, I like it to come back up. Uh, especially with peppers and things, because it will help with sun scald later. And I might have to cut that again once, maybe twice during the growing season, depending on whether it's competing or not. Is it an annual or perennial? I'm going to get to all that. Okay. So, again, here's the harvesting the garlic, and there's that same bed. Um, it's about maybe a month later. So, under sowing, terrible picture. <laughs> I need to change this, and I just haven't done it. But under sowing is great. You don't want it for a low crop like a carrot. You want it for something tall. Corn is the, the one that, that's, uh, uh, or pole beans, or kale after it's, you know, up a couple of feet. But once the, your crop is a third of the way through its maturity growth, you can plant, um, so underneath it, some cover crop seeds and get all the benefits of, of the cover crop, of covering the soil, keeping it dry, keeping it moist, and photosynthesizing, feeding the corn as well. Now, like I said in the beginning, many of us are programmed for clean beds, clean gardens. You don't want any competition. You don't got plant that weed, the other vegetable near your vegetable of choice. It's going to take the sun. It's going to take the moisture. It's going to take the nutrients. Keep them away. So that's what we're up with, and that's a paradigm of competition. And this is a paradigm of cooperation. So if we can make that shift in our brain, um, I've actually had friends in, in Wendell, where I live, come up to me and say, I didn't believe you, but I tried it. <laughs> it really does work. Um, that the cooperation between plants is really important. But you don't want things that will damage the plant of your choice. So you don't want the cover crop to top it and keep it from getting shade. You don't want it to be so crowded out that it doesn't get air movement to keep uh, disease away. So you just have to manage it a little bit of how you do it and the timing and how thickly you plant. So we talk about broadcasting. Well, you know, we probably don't have 40 acres out there to broadcast, because broadcasting are doing this. So it's more a sprinkle. And at the end, I have a chart from Cornell of how much <coughs> per acre and per square foot. Personally, I've never even looked at it to use it, but 
I just use my intuition of sprinkling from being gardeners. You know how seed comes up. In the spring, I put more in because it's cold, it's damp, uh, it, you know, it may rot before it germinates. In the summer, I put in less because it, the temperatures and conditions are available. Now, as any seed, they need to touch soil and they need to have water. So until they germinate, if it's really dry, I'll water them. But uh, if, if, it's, if it's not, I don't bother doing anything except uh, putting them. I'm going to go through these. So I'll skip this part. So this is uh, my partner uh, doing an experiment of doing a mixed cover crop seed through a strawberry patch where the strawberries um, aren't very thick. And frost seeding is fantastic. You know, when you go out in April and you see all those fissures in the soil with the little crystals. So if you've sprinkled your oats and peas, maybe radish then, as it thaws during the day when the sun not it, they close up and then they open at night when they're cold. They're going to suck your seed down in so you don't have to worry about planting it as much. Um, so this, this is a bed that... Um, had a lot of mulch, and by spring it's only, a, a, I don't know, an inch and a half or two. You can see there's soil through it here and there. So I take it and sprinkle the seeds on top of that, take the rake and shuffle it in so that the, most of the seeds will go down through and get contact with the soil. I, I don't pull it off to plant cover crop through it. Another way I do it is, um, the, if this is a cover crop, uh, behind these are uh, winter squash seedlings I started in the greenhouse. So, you know, again, an early cover crop. I think it was that same bed that I just had the rake showing you. And it came up not too thick, medium thick. And then I, I cut some of it and I squished some of it. It's called crimping so that the stalks get bent. So they don't, they, you haven't killed them, but you're slowing them way down. Um, put the transplant in probably three weeks before this photo. And so this uh, this one is the end of July, so this is probably uh, end of uh, beginning of July. And here it is, they're starting to run, and you can see that some of the cover crop is still coming up through it, but it's not in competition with, you know, it's not just blocking the sun or anything, it's just there um, photosynthesizing. The other way that I like to use cover crop is a shade protection for um, things like the greens, like lettuce, by having uh, having buckwheat especially in uh, with it. gives it shade, so I get maybe uh, 10 days, two weeks more before they bolt. It keeps them a little cooler. Or with peppers, when we get to prevent salt, sun scald on peppers sometimes, um, I leave that like the cover crop after the, the fruit is on and being set, I let them come up a little more so they, they, they shade it. Um, here is my experiment. I've been doing three or four years now. And um, so we all know what that is, garden sorrel. And it's, it's a weed. And the other one is chickweed that I still have a lot of. But they, uh, they're kind of mostly lowish growing. And they don't seem to be... Uh, that much of a problem in the beds where I let them grow. Um, some of the soil experts like Elaine Ingham, I don't know if you know her, but she, she's a really fantastic work, woman working scientist in this field. She said, whoever comes up with the um, perennial cover crop for coal climates like the Northeast is going to be, um, you know, it's rich and famous and help us all out. Well, these aren't perennial, but they're up really early in the spring and they're there, I don't have to replant them. Um, so I started using that as a cover crop. So these are my squat, uh, cucumbers, and they're going to go up a trellis. Um, so I cut these maybe once, and then even if they get six, eight inches tall, the, the sorrel doesn't bother me because the cucumbers are way up here. Uh, the same with the peppers. Um, anyway, experiment. What do you have in your garden? Can you keep it under control? Hold on with that if you can. Write it down. Uh, and and then I'd really love to know if you find, what you find out if you experiment with things that really work. <laughs> um, okay, so what are these cover crops that Sharon's talking about? Um, again, this is in the handout. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to go through them 
one by one here. So oats and peas are what I first started when I didn't know what I was doing and I thought of cover crop oh, oats and peas. So um, I have more experience with them. But I love them. They grow, they can grow any time of the, the season. They're cold tolerant, so I put them in that mid to end of April in the frost seeding. I can plant them any time all summer or even early uh, early fall into September and they'll still germinate and grow before they get really wiped out. Um, so all of these things suppress weeds and do various things that each have a little bit different, like all of, all of us are a little bit different in what we, uh, our, our uh, benefits are in, in the society. So, oh, I should start by saying, I can answer your question. I only grow things that are going to be killed by winter, except for except some clover, because I don't want to till. And rye is a fantastic cover crop, but I don't use it because you have to be careful. You have to monitor it. You have to be there right at the time before it becomes a weed, so that you either cut it back, or turn it under, which we don't do. Or, or wait for that milky stage to cut it and all that. I can't, can't keep that in my program. I just don't do it. So the things I grow are going to be killed by the really cold 20 degree temperatures. So some of you from the Cape might, might need to make sure that it work um, for you. Okay, buckwheat. Buckwheat is uh, it's not a grass. It has larger leaves, so it really does lot more on the suppressing of weeds. Um, it has these beautiful little flowers. And just, just to show you, you know, this is after three weeks of from germination. <coughs> because they're, they're, they're tender. They're almost like a succulent. They're stalk. So you don't want to, you can't plant those until you would put your tomatoes out, maybe a little bit before. Not much. So you're planting them and it's warmer. They'll germinate faster than those oats did. One of the other benefits besides the soil improvement is that they're a pollinator, the forage for your pollinators and for your beneficial insects. And I can go out there, I always try to have at least a little bit, a couple of feet uh, of buckwheat spaced out, plant every 10 days maybe, so that there's always some of those flowers because they just, they just love them. You go out and you just, zzz, zzz, zzz. I try to take pictures and, and I just couldn't, there's like, so many varieties of these tiniest little insects that I have no idea who they are or what they are, but I'm hoping that they're all happy <laughs> and that they make me happy. But um, so you've got a flush of aphids in your uh, kale. Just like, oh God. But then all of a sudden, there's your lay bugs or your lace wings, and they, they're devouring them, and they're so happy, but then they're all gone. The uh, aphids are gone, and then you'll you leave by just looking around, hungry. You no know, more aphids. Oh, next door. They got aphids next door. So they leave, and then when you get the next flush of pests, they're not there. So you have this, or other bumbles like Queen Anne's lace and, and uh, you know, the white, little white florets. They'll hang around, and they won't go to your neighbor. They'll be there for the next time you need them. So, so sorghum, Sudan grass. Uh, it's, it's tender, so you can't plant it early. It looks a heck of a lot like corn. It's got the really wide leaves, and it's got those funny roots um, stick up. Um, but it is an amazing biomass producer. It can, it can just, if you, if you leave it and don't cut it, um, cut it above six inches or so as it's growing, it'll just keep producing. So if you need mulch, if you need compost um, additives, they're amazing. And this is just a full mix of, of things in there, but those tall, that's, that's the, and the other thing about them is that they suppress the root knot nematode. So I try to plant my carrots after the season after I've had, um, where I've had Sudan grass, because I've pretty much eliminated, you know, those gnarled and, and tri triples and whatever in the root. Uh, for some reason, it really does help that. And then the forage radish looks a lot like a daikon because it is. Just when you buy the seeds, if you buy it as a, as a 
cover crop, and they're a heck of a lot cheaper than a vegetable seed. Plus, they're, they've been, they, they haven't been bred to be quite as tender and everything. So, but I, I, I go out there and I'm making kimchi, and I don't have a daikon planted. I use them. It might be a little bit, uh, texture might be a little bit more chewy, but uh, it's okay. So, yes, you can eat cover crops. The other one I really love is the peas, the field pea. I wouldn't want to take the, the growing tips off my snap peas, but I'm just happy with uh, field peas anywhere from <clears throat> when they're a couple of feet tall to you know three feet tall. That, that growing tip where the little tendril is, and it's like a little clamshell. As they open, it has the flower buds in it and the baby leaves. I pinch that off three, four, six inches and stir fry it or have it in a salad. It's delicious. The old straw makes a really good tea. The um, red clover blossoms make a tea. So these things aren't just for cover crop. And you're not damaging because like, I have a whole bed of, of oats and peas and you know, picking enough for a dinner every few days really doesn't set that plant back at all. So these are the, the ones that I don't, um, that won't winter kill. So the, the white Dutch clover, which is really great in pathways, and it's a nitrogen fixer, um, so I like it a lot, and I, I do have it around, and I just kind of move it out as it starts to be too tall in the bed. It's also a really good um, living mulch at a, an area maybe 15 by 20 that was um, I hadn't been using and had had wanted to create a extend a garden into it. So I planted this uh, for a couple of years and then I put cardboard on top of it and then where the, where I knew I was going to make beds, I put wood chips on top of that <coughs> in, the, in the fall. And come spring, I just planted through. Uh, wood chips and the cardboard into that, and that was like really amazing growing. I think I did kale that year, kale transplants, because there's so much nitrogen in that soil. Um, and it had been really red, uh, beefed up a lot. And the red, the red clover, I actually never planted that. I get a lot of things that come on their own, they think they should be there, so mostly I leave them. Uh, and they're an amazing nitrogen fixer too. They're biennial, so it's easy if you don't want them to cut them below the crown, put the soil below the soil, and um, it'll set them back. So this this is just to show you the nitrogen fixing part. This was picked at the end of April, April, and that's all that black stuff is that glomalin holding on to those roots. But it's very there was very little green, so nothing had really gotten photosynthesizing yet, the soil is too cold or just getting started. This is a plant, a red clover plant in August. Um, it's a little out of focus, I'm sorry, but anyway, the top was a big green top. And look at all of these little white sacks. Those are the nodules of free nitrogen that came from the air and is now bioavailable to your plants for free so you're not buying a nitrogen fertilizer. So the big thing these days is cover crop cocktails, and that, that I think they say if you could have at least eight different cover crops in your mix when you're planting it, that bed that I showed you with the yardstick and my cat in it, that had a lot of different things. Um, and I, I've added barley, um, sunflower seeds, and um, any extra old vegetable seeds that I have left over green beans or whatever, I throw it all in. It doesn't hurt because they're going in as a cover crop. Um, so I'm mixing, especially with you and grasses, you want to have a mix of that so that you're getting all kinds of um, things happening in the soil. If you're mixing your own, you want to pick for your outcome. My outcome is winter kill. So you may decide that you don't care about that and choose another thing when you make your mix. So how do we manage these cover crops? Um, we already talked about most of this, broadcasting, crimping, uh, the broad fork. Um, so I'm sorry to say that the, pers the, the, the company the, uh, makes these things. This is my go-to tool. It's a Japanese sickle. It's made, uh, well, I don't know if it's made it, but it's distributed locally to me anyway by OESCO, the Orchard Equipment Supply Company in, in Conway, Massachusetts. 
under 10 bucks. You can pass it around. It's serrated. This one has been probably in use for 10 years or so. It's getting a bit dull, but it's still... Uh, I can cut a whole bed of cover crops in, in you know, kind of the size of the bed really quickly. I can go below the soil line and kill those roots uh, or above. I use it to harvest vegetables. They could give me a commission. I called them yesterday and I said, bring a lot. And they said, oh, we're not coming today. So, too bad. Um, again, you can, there's, there's so many uses for them. I often let, like I said, things go to seed. The buckwheat especially can become a nuisance weed, some people feel, because um, the seed the, the seed doesn't all mature at once on those little flower clusters and mature over a span of time. And the seed, it's like little brown things, uh, kasha. That's what that is, that little triangular shape, kind of dark brown, like coffee beet, coffee beet brown. So if you don't want them to go to seed, then cut it before it's mature. But if I let them go to seed, then I go around and grab handfuls of them off and put them in a bag, and then next year that's what I use instead of buying it. And if some goes to seed in the bed, like that picture of the squash, Buckwheat in that, I didn't plant that, that would just come. It doesn't bother me because they, uh, they snap off the ones of me if they're somewhere I don't want them. So there's that little tool when it's newer, it has a red handle so you can find it. Um, so this is the other tool, winter. Um, and this is in December looking out, uh, everything has died back. So there's no cover crop really showing. But you can also see there's no bare soil anywhere either. And then we get, whoops, the, we get the uh, deep snow. It's just a, it's an amazing fertilizer in itself. Uh, so this is just a, a quick thing here to show you. Again, this was a garlic bed. So planted at the end of July. Here it is the following spring. So that, again, probably had 10 or 12 inches of uh, mulch put in the winter. And this spring, it has hardly anything. But here's the soil. It's in that bed. So you can go, you can plant, you can just push it aside and put seeds or transplant in it. Or you could cover and put another cover plant right in if you're not going to use that bed right away. And shuffle it with a rake. But you end up with just phenomenal seed, uh, soil. cover crops next door. Um, okay, so this is just another example of how I use it. So I've stopped planting my main carrots until, it used to be, the big, they used to say after the beginning of July, then the fly that lays the root maggot egg is, uh, won't affect it. So I used to plant the first week of July, but with the climate craziness it is, I'm planting later and later because I want them to mature and be ready when I put them in forage. So um, now it's about the second or third week in July that I plant. This got a little out of hand because I was having some vacation issues. But did the frost seed uh, early. Whoops, wrong button, sorry. Here they are germinating. So this is the end of June. I'm getting it to the bed ready to plant my carrots. So this was supposed to be a lot of uh, oats in there too, but it was old seed and didn't make it, so there's fewer oats. But that's the that's at least three feet tall of field peas, which are fixed with nitrogen and smothering and blah blah blah. Um, also very good for your stir fries. So I cut it at the soil line, trying not to disturb the soil. And again, look at that, and the wormies coming up. So I pulled a couple for the slideshow. Don't accuse me of pulling things on purpose. Uh, without purpose. Anyway, um, look at those nodules. So where I've cut that off, all of that, all of that nitrogen is now available in the soil for whoever comes for those carrots. Um, after I cut it, I put it back on the bed to use as a mulch until I was ready to plant those carrots. It dried out. I used a pitchfork to um, move it aside and use elsewhere as mulch. Um, carrots were going in here, and 
kind of do a slideshow for you. So I use the, the broad fork just to loosen it a little. Also, bowls. This type of gardening uh, it makes bowls very happy, so I just live with them. Um, I don't plant potatoes anymore because they got to get more than me. But almost every, I mean, there's nothing else that I don't grow because of them because I still get a very large crop. So I use the broad fork. On. I didn't need it, but I'm trying to make a picture here. So then here it is the end of Ju July, and I'd taken that mulch off for a few days, waiting to see if anything would germinate. So yeah, look, you know, here's a little green one. Here's, so I do have a little bit of weed germination. So it's not a huge amount. I put the solarization on it just to, uh, because the soil, soil had been disturbed, so it's weed seeds have come up. So now they're being fried. And this is uh, in August. The uh, Back here, this is all carrots and the beets are trying, coming through. And so they've germinated. There's hardly any weed pressure at this point. But I do go through and put shredded leaves as a mulch uh, as, it, as, as they grow because really easy to have them over top if, if, if weeds blow in or anything and until they get big enough to keep moisture in. But that bed we prepped for this with very little work other than planting those seeds and cutting it, moving it off. And there are some good carrots. So foliar tea, another bad slide. I just can't seem to get anyone to take my picture when I'm in the vegetable garden with my sprayer. But, um, you know, I have this fantastic soil, but everybody needs a little boost every so often. So some, some years, depending what I see happening in the garden, it's, you know, once a month maybe. Some years, it's, a, it's more frequently. Take a five-gallon bucket and go around the garden and, and put uh, nettles, comfrey, uh, various herbs and things that, are, that I think I want to add. Anything that has, if I want to spray for growth, then I'll find things that are have fast growing tips. Last year, the kiwi. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Northern Hurry kiwi, but they they send out these tendrils like six, eight inches a foot a day. They break some of those off, cut some of those off, and put them in. But the enzymes in there are going to be help uh, my plants. So whatever is happening, uh, oat straw, garlic, let it sit for a day or two in the sun, strain it, and then. I use uh, fish emulsion, uh, not emulsion, but fish, liquid fish, and uh, liquid seaweed to add a little bit extra boost and, and spray. So what, if you can, you want to spray, let's say, when the birds are singing so early in the day or late in the evening. That's because uh, the underside of the leaves have these breathing uh, apparatus called stomas, stomas, and they're open during that time of day. Uh, and so you try to spray underneath the leaves if you can, uh, as well as on the surface. So what you're doing is giving them a boost, but you're also colonizing the leaf surface with beneficial, happy microorganisms that you've just um, made tea from. And so an organism, a detrimental bacteria comes along, the leaf is already happy and healthy, there's no room for disease to enter. Okay, so what happens if you have poor de depleted soil? Uh, you might need to remineralize. Uh, or so for many years, I would you know, get my soil test, and then I would I would order through the the bulk order or whatever, and getting uh, different kinds of calcium or, or potassium or whatever was needed, green sand, and that, and then spread it where I needed it. But I don't, I haven't done that in ten years, maybe five years. Uh, because the soil, once it gets to that place where it is really all meshing together and everybody's working together, those fungal mycelium can go down to subsoil <coughs> and take, the plant can send a message, I need some uh, potassium or molybdenum or something strange. It can go down, uh, send that message and to, to the hyphae that are mycelium that are down deeper into near the mineral soil 
and they use their enzymes and whatever they do chemically to take that inert um, sub-mineral and make it bioavailable to your plant and, and shuttle it through that transportation network back to your plant root. The plant gets happier, the plant makes more sugars and things and dumps it to the soil. The microbes are happier, it's just this thing. So, so you don't have to keep paying for inputs after you get to this point. Put the milk of Buffalo out of business. Um, we also, in the beginning, went to um, local quarries and got float, which is what they call some of the, the really fine material that they've um, in, their, in their process in, in mining, and brought that back. If you go to various quarries, you get the salt in one and the granite in another and whatever. Sometimes even I've gone to monuments, you know, some the great people that pass. Because they, they, when they're doing their engraving and polishing, there's extra minerals just lying around that they're happy to get rid of. So then you just add that to your soil to, to help boost where it's been over um, extracted in the past. So that, that's another thing people, people near and dear to me start out. You can't be doing this because you're extracting all the time. You've got to keep adding. And it's like, we're extracting from the soil, but the, because of the system with, a, with your microbes, they are doing the extraction too, so you're not just taking out uh, tons of vegetables and not replacing. And we're, you know, we're making compost too, and we have mulch. And so there is some replacement going on, but it's not, it's not like a mining operation. So for that depleted soil, uh, if you've got really compacted soil, plant a lot of those radishes. They go really deep, and they, they break up the compaction, and then when they die, they're just like this big mash, mushy mash in the soil. But it's just like fantastic winter food, and so you, and you end up improving your soil texture. So a really good book that um, Michael Phillips, he's the organic orcharding guy from New Hampshire, and he did a, a workshop last year, I think it was a year ago, summer conference that I went to, and he has a new book, uh, well, not so new anymore, but Mycorrhizal Planet, and it's a fantastic book, it talks all about everything I'm talking about, um, and then he talks about how to, how to have some of these inoculants that are very expensive when you buy them, and he was finding that a lot of them uh, weren't worth the money, and so he, he did a research, and this is his list of those that he thought were worth the money. And I, I like the guy, I trust him, so I'm passing that along. But you can make your own inoculants. You can go out to the woods under a really healthy uh, tree, and there's that leaf litter. You can take off the top of the fresh leaves, and underneath there's that rich black and often with the white mycelium running through it. You bring some of that back and plant it here and there through your garden or put it in your tea. Uh, you're, in, you're importing these microorganisms that may be missing if you had if you started with a sterile kind of garden. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. There's also something called Korean natural farming, and I think Milk is doing a workshop on that sometime soon, where how to make larger quantities of these kind of, uh, what are they called, IMOs, uh, I mean, something that'll come to me in a minute. So resources on your list, there's that seeding rate if you want it. A um, few years ago, uh, Northeastern University was doing a, a carbon, soil carbon uh, and I, testing program. I sent in our soil sample and it came back with, so this was maybe four years ago, that we were 72% sequestering. Um, I thought it was fantastic. And, okay, so we're going to get to questions in just two seconds. Weird. We have some time, but if you could just take a minute and think, is there anything that I talked about or anything that it clicked in your head that reminded you of something else that you might want to implement this year? Um, just make a note of it before it flies out the door when you go through somebody else or you're out there having fun with friends. Um, while you think about it, I'm going to just keep talking because that's I love to talk. Um, this was a, is a tomato plant. Uh, that was seven feet 
feet plus tall. I used to grow the tomatoes. They would about, about July, August. What would be happening? From the ground up, they'd be yellowing and turning brown. The leaves would be falling off. And it would stay green up here, but it was like, oh, that's early blight. You always get early blight. No matter what you do, you get early blight. Oh, well, yeah, early blight is part of nature that comes to take care of the sick or dead um, plant material so that we don't live under 200 feet of dead plants. So that's its nature, that's what it's supposed to do. So why, why is it attacking your lower leaves of your tomato plant? It's because as the plant grows, it wants to feed, everybody wants their children to survive. Those seeds, it wants those seeds and the growing tips of your plant to get the most nutrients. So, if the soil doesn't have the nutrients to feed that plant, or you're not spraying it, to the, watering it to feed it, it has to get its nutrients from somewhere. And it takes it from your lower, lower leaves and branches and moves it up to where it's most needed. And so, this is just an example of the healthy soil there that creates a healthy plant that isn't um, having to rob its lower leaves to get the minerals and vitamins or whatever it is getting it from the soil. That's all I'm about to answer questions. Did you have the tomatoes up there? Do you also just put your tomatoes down and leave that root system in the soil? Do you cut your tomatoes down and leave the root system in the soil? I do. Tomatoes I do. I'm not worried about the late blight or the this or that. Um, I cut all my vegetables at the ground level and compost the tops. So, um, they're taping this, so if you just, I have a question, say it really loudly, please. Or loud, whatever. Yes. Um, so, I have three quick questions. Uh, so, one is, uh, how deep was it the soil when you first started, and how deep is it now? And then when you talked about you know, the nutritional, like you want to answer one of the time? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, there was about a half an inch of floor stuff. I cut the trees at the soil level, and then I built up wood chips and manure. Um, you scratch through that floor, that little bit of leaf layer and viney stuff at the bottom of, you know, under the forest trees. This was now a huge, healthy soil with a big mass of it. So, um, subsoil was within one an inch and a half. So now, yes. it's, it's, I'd say, some of the older beds, it's at least a, a foot or more of really healthy, and then it, you know, it's not. And it's just going to keep getting thicker and thicker. Yes. Yeah. And then, when you talked about the nutritional value on the plants, uh, from the conventional system to now, that it was like 30% more, did you ever consider um, doing a brick scale test and finding out exactly what it is? So, the brick scale is a scale of 1 to 30. Uh, most conventional plants are maybe, let's say corn, 4 to 5, and it should be maybe 24 to 28. Did you ever quantify that, or did you ever consider that? Oh, I, I, I've, I've gone to the workshops that NOFA has held about doing all that, and I just haven't, I haven't done it. Um, I should have Dan come out with his little meters and everything, but I can taste it. Right. You, you really, can see it. really can see it. And sometimes if I don't have something when I need it, you know, and we're desperate, uh, we'll go out and buy an organic whatever. And it's still not like what we have grown on our soil. Right. Um, so, no, I haven't done it, but, uh, you know. Very good. And then final uh, consideration. Uh, with, with other gardeners, I've heard of them putting perennial borders around the edge of their garden so that you'll get pollinators all the time. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, putting a herbaceous perennial uh, border. Um, at this point, we haven't done it. Um, sometimes it's hard to say this, but I am on board. We have just decided to purchase and sale. And we're selling our um, selling that soil. Oh. <laughs> um, so when it came a few years ago, the thought of doing that, we just, we're both getting older and we just can't keep up. We look out the window and instead of seeing 
everything perfectly chaotic, but perfect the way we want it, we just see the forest starting to say, hey, I'm taking over. So we wanted to pass on. We have just signed with two young farmers who are going to hopefully keep the homestead going. So, But it's a great idea if you, if you have time to do that in your lifespan. Yes? So I love that you have the sorrel still growing as, um, under the other plants. Yay, I don't have to weed out the sorrel anymore. But what I, I have a big, um, I have a lot of creeping charlie in my garden, which is a perennial, I think. But I was wondering, but when I pull out the creeping charlie, I often notice that the soil seems to be really rich under it. It seems to attract worms. But I was just wondering if you had any experience with using that, allowing creeping charlie to stay in your bed. I don't know creeping charlie. What does it look like? Um, I'm sorry. You know, I'm into Latin. I can't think of a Latin name. Um, Anybody else have a different name for it? Lawn ivy. Ground ivy. Ground ivy. It has purple, mint like yeah. flowers. It's very, it has roundish mm -hmm. leaves. Fuzzy leaves. Roundish serrated, serrated leaves. Oh, no, I don't have that. Really? You know, you know, oh. So okay. what I would say is, you know, I'm not going to have say, yeah, go do it, and then have it take over your whole garden, and then you are so disappointed. Well, but, really but you're, what you're saying is that there, you're, you are already seeing that it's moisture, the soil looks richer, and there's worms and everything. So maybe experiment with a small section where it already is, Just but don't let it expand until you know, yeah, this Just is Just go ahead and plant into it. And then how, how tall does it get when it's just, oh. just the ground cover? Two inches. Two inches. Yeah. I might be getting some of that. Because I'm not giving up. I'm moving right next door and having a garden smaller. Yes. Um, I live in an area with a lot of wild turkeys. So whenever I put out my cover crop seed, um, any beds that are unprotected, the turkeys within like 12 hours will have just eaten all the seed. So, I mean, short of physically putting in barriers to the beds, do you have any suggestions? I don't. That happened once with us, not in the garden, thank goodness, but in uh, I was planting it in the chicken run. And the chickens weren't in it yet. Um, I do have, I, when I do put some in the garden, I'm worried about, especially in the spring when the flocks of robins come in and they're just like churning, they're not eating those seeds necessarily, but they're, they're making a mess of it. Um, so I put rime, especially some of the old agrovani kind of rime, some of the older ones that I don't care about, and I throw that over it until it's germinating and enough, enough that they're not going to finish it off. Yes? Yeah. Um, I, so our organization, we, our farm is on a, on a, sorry, our floodplain. And so one of the things that we're really struggling with is how to cover the crop in a way, like what would be the best combination, right, of cover crop so that it can really begin to help us hold our soil together as well as retain uh, all the nutrients that, that we need because a lot of the runoff kind of takes everything with it. Yeah, so that's kind of been our struggle for the last couple of years. So it floods, so it's underwater, or just it's very wet? Or it's very wet. It's very wet. I mean, there's certain parts that are underwater, but just there's certain parts that get really wet, and it just won't um, drain out. Yeah, yeah, it won't so. drain out, and then the soil will totally kind of... Yeah, I don't have a, a, like a silver bullet answer. No. I could help you look at different ones and do research which ones really do well in moist conditions yeah. and that absorb a lot of water so that you you can help dry it out enough that some of the ones that are you know are less happy in, in moisture can also get established. Once you once you get your soil texture um, deep enough, mm -hmm. you, will, you know, that you should have it do drainage. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw, you know, my beds, they're not raised, raised, but, you know, for all these years, if they're higher than where my pads are. Yeah. And in the spring, when we have a lot of rain, often there's one section where the pads are, you know, three inches of water, but the beds are what really well drained. I could plant in them if I wanted to, okay. because the soil has improved as such, and the pads 
instead of just using it green? Uh, yeah, I mostly just cut it and let it lay where it is, green, right on top of it, unless I need it somewhere else more. Uh, and again, as it dries out, it, you know, it is taking some nutrients, but it's also going to be giving back more than it's taking out. So, um, you know, just cut it and let it fall. You said at some point that um, in your garden now, you don't even need to use your rock board very much, or you're using it less and less, I think is what right. you said. And so is that, I'm just curious, is that because the texture itself is such that the aeration is fine, you don't even need to break things up even a little bit? In the yes. So the question was that I'm not using the broad fork as much, uh, and why is that? And it's because the texture has such, it's such really good aggregate and tilt that I don't really need to fluff it and lighten it anymore um, unless I feel like I need this muscle up here built up um, or I'm doing it for a presentation so I can show you something. But, yes? Um, are you, your compost, is it a hot compost or is it a lazy man's compost? It's a lazy woman's molaring compost. <laughs> Yeah, I used to turn, I used to do the three bed, turn, turn. And maybe you could tell from some of the other uh, things about you know, not wanting to haul in things and let the plants do it themselves. But as I've gotten older, I'm trying to save my body more and use my brain in nature. And, you know, in nature, the leaves on trees fall, plants, leaves fall, and they turn into compost over time. And so, so can my compost. I add kitchen waste, I add um, chicken litter, because we, we keep chicken for eggs in the summer, um, we have been doing for me. So it has, I, I use a deep litter in our winter group, so there's, there's a lot of wood chip and then a lot of poop, so that goes into the compost. Or if I'm taking a bed out of production for, just for cover crops, I'll do a sheet mulch on that and then plant my cover crop and insulate it. How early do you start your cold frost in the spring? Um, I try to get those cold, hardy ones out as soon as I can if, the, if I see any bare soil, if the mulch has been uh, decomposed so much that it's really thin. I'll put it on um, sometimes, <laughs> uh, last year especially, I got carried away and put it pretty much everywhere. And then it was like, well, what am I going to do with my early greens? And I got it kill these things when they're only an inch tall, and that was a waste of seed. So I just have to think, you know, these are the beds that I'm not going to be planting in. They're going to be cover crop all year. These are the other beds that I'm going to be putting crops in, but not until June, so I can do those, and do those, and the ones where I'm putting early crops, I better not put them in right now. So. Could you put them in the year before? Oh, yeah. I so, I mean, you could do it like in August and then use that next spring for your own crops? Yes. So the question is how late, I'm changing a little, how late can you plant a cover crop in the fall? And, I, you know, I plant them um, late August, early September, the oats and peas and red, because they can take some cold. And they might get four inches, but they might get a foot and a half, depending when we first get that 20 degree time. So it's a, you know, it's a crapshoot, and to me the seeds, uh, they're, you know, they're not cheap, but they're not that expensive that I can't take the chance of how much soil I get through. Like, and that, you know, that might be something for that wet area. Maybe by late summer, those beds are drier, and you could put some more cover crops in uh, when the beds are drier and have them grow for two to three months before they get killed. This is uh, oats and peas and barley and everybody else, and this is, you know, just shows that when you don't use uh, bad things in the garden, you get all kinds of beneficial help. 